So Ruth, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And hi, Ruth. Richard here. I'm uh, very, very eager to, to catch up with all the stuff that you've got to say. Now, for those who don't know you, would you please introduce yourself and sort of where you are and what you do, and then we'll jump into trauma. Sure. My name is Ruth Lanius, and I'm a professor of psychiatry at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada, which is right between Toronto and Detroit. And I'm basically a clinician scientist who's really interested in trauma-related disorders. Um, I'm really interested in what's happening in the brain when people interact socially, when they make eye contact. And our group is also very interested in neuroscientifically informed treatments. So how can the neurobiology really inform what treatments we use for trauma? And uh, when, when we think about treatment, we really think about a very integrative approach targeting really mind, brain, body, and soul. Well, there's a perfect uh, definition of the science of psychotherapy yeah, um, I wonder. And, and exactly the sort of thing that, that Matt and I, uh, you know, just pursue as a, as a, as an attitude and approach towards, towards therapy. So uh, just so beautifully put, thanks Ruth, everybody. That, that's the first takeaway. That's how you treat people or that's how you approach the knowledge. It's wonderful. Thanks. Now, Ruth, we wanted to dive into sort of the leading edge of what's going on in, in trauma therapy. And uh, we had Seaburn Fisher on the show not long ago, and yeah. um, and she was singing your praises, uh, and she said, you, we must talk to Ruth. So, so we've got you on the show to find out exactly what is uh, changing, emerging, what's on the leading edge of trauma therapy. So uh, where can we dive in to that topic? Let's start with, uh, you know, how do we treat trauma? How can we approach this topic? And often it's a very political topic, but I think it's actually, uh, it, there's a, a simple way to start into the topic uh, that makes it non-political. And I think that reduces sort of the infighting because I think one problem is that, you know, developers of certain therapies always think, you know, that is the approach. And I want to move us a little bit away from that because I think when we think about an integrative approach to trauma treatment, it's really using all the modalities and bringing them all together. And, and kind, and of, kind of going back to the person a bit is a nice place to start, isn't it? Mm. You know, what's, what, what actually is a human going through and what helps a human uh, rather than, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so always starting with the person and asking the question, how has this trauma affected you? Right. And not just how has this trauma affected you, but also how has the aftermath of the traumatic ex experience affected you and what's most traumatic for you? And also seeing the trauma in the context in which it occurred, right, because the context can make a huge difference. So really understanding the individual and then you know, tailoring the treatment to the individual and to the individual's suffering. Does, I guess, I yes, because we can read a lot about trauma theory, and I guess we can generalize a lot of that, and we we sort of Im, put make an imprint upon the person that's in front of us, and, and say, well, the way that they're presenting it has to fit into this um, theoretical framework somehow. Um, but that's probably not the best approach. We we start sort of with just exploring the the person themselves. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that I've been taught and a lot of us are taught is to treat a diagnosis, right? And, you know, there's certainly something to that, but I think you need to treat the person and the, right. you know, really take that personalized approach and, you know, figure out what is the major issue for this individual. A little bit like the psychodynamic therapists who are very good at, right? Really figuring out what is the major issue for this person. And so then kind of combining that with, yes, there is a diagnosis, but there is an individual behind that and really targeting that, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, we, we often use some uh, uh, musical uh, music metaphors because uh, both of us are musicians. We have quite a few musicians who come on who, who yeah. are uh, great therapists, you know, Joseph Ledoux, uh, you know, for, for one. But this this idea that that uh, even a great melody when a musician's approaching a great melody, that's just where you start. That's that gives you the foundational framework from which you then create all the individualistic elements. And I think this is some, this idea uh, that, that we are actually bound, that we should be bound by the nature of the method because it's been researched and because it has the, the, you know, the evidence base and so on and so forth. This, has this become a, is this a burden that uh, we're, we're learning how to um, reframe or, or uh, you know, what's the validity of, of um, that's coming with this sticking to the method? Yeah, and I think that's a great question. And of course, you know, evidence-based treatments are important, but I think equally important is that we keep in mind the limitations of these treatments. And, you know, thinking about, you know, what question we've answered with the evidence and what questions we haven't answered. And for example, some of the sickest patients, most of the patients I treat would never make it into a study because they're too ill, because oh. there's Societal, they're harming themselves, and there's, those are usually exclusion criteria, right? And so, I think we really need to also think about, you know, treatment in real life. You know, so, yeah. So let's have, let's you start uh, as here's how we here's how to approach uh, a patient. We'll just sort of let you go with uh, uh, with your person. So, what I do when I see somebody for the first time? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I greet them in the waiting room and, you know, I watch them walk into the office so I can, you know, see how they walk. I can see their posture, you know, how comfortable they are or how uncomfortable they are. And then, you know, I let them enter, enter the office first. And I always say to them, you know, pick a chair and pick the chair that makes you feel most comfortable. And that gives me a lot of information also because some people are very shy, you know, they don't feel deserving of picking the chair that they feel most comfortable in. Um, others, you know, sit right by the wall because they're very afraid, you know, to sit anywhere else. Other people need to sit so they can exit the, you know, close to the door so they can exit at any time. So that gives you a lot of information, but I think it also gives people a sense of control. And I think that's so important in trauma, right? Because people have lost control. And so in the th therapeutic setting, you know, you want to give them as much control as possible. Yeah. So is this a, a, a framework? Because that's where it is. We're just sort of building a picture here. I'm just, uh, Matt and I are just going to grab at these interesting words. And that, that control, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting um, element because it's both a, a, an internal and a, a trauma-interrupted um, process, but it's also an external uh, uh, aspect as well. Um, and you're shifting back those external um, frameworks of control right back to them. And so that's a Okay, uh, you've got it, which is a beautiful start. And does that that helps you then have a more isolated or, or a more um, clear view of what's going on within them, you know, inside their issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, you see how they react to, you know, letting them have that control. And some people, you know, feel much more relaxed with that and much safer. And for others, it's difficult. You know, they've never had a chance to take initiative and take control, especially if they've been in a very abusive relationship. And so some actually can't make a decision where they sit and they keep checking back. Well, well is it okay if I sit here? Yeah. You know, I don't want to sit in your chair. And so it gives you a lot of information right away. Yeah. So once you have the client feeling um, comfortable, what is, what's the next step? What are you looking for then? So the next step, I would explain, you know, that uh, my understanding is that this person referred them and that uh, my understanding is that they're here for an assessment where we figure out where they're at and, you know, where they want to go in order to uh, feel better and feel more part of this life. 
and uh, I check back with them whether that's their understanding. And usually then I say, how do you feel about being here? What's it like for you to be here again, to get a feel and to get it out in the open? And I always say, you know, it's not easy to come into a stranger's office and be expected to, uh, you know, talk about some of the deepest pain within you. And so I want to make it as, as safe as possible. And yep. so I get feedback what it's like for them to be here. And yep. then I say, you know, I want you to be comfortable. Uh, if you need to take a break, if you're uncomfortable with anything, I ask you, just let me know. You know, I don't want this to be a torture session for you. Right. Yeah. And so important. So many of these these things, I mean, we're uh, quite often trained and to do it with, with empathy and, and care and things. But the people come in, they sit down, they say, well, that's wonderful. Please tell me uh, why have you come and what would you like me to do? And um, it's so it's like hitting somebody in the head with a hammer. Sometimes I, I, I feel, but the word that the other word that jumps out for me is comfort. Now I actually devoted a whole chapter of one of my books on that. And my most fascinating thing was, first of all, it was the, the big researcher was in nursing, uh, a, a woman named Kokolba. And the other one was that the, the, uh, the, the root uh, Greek or I think it's Greek root is actually to strengthen. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. rather than to soften and make easy and sloshy. And so this idea of that rapport is about strengthening the client. But you've got them there and do it. Now, here comes the difficult bit. I mean, this is beautiful a beautiful uh, description of, of creating that sort of rapport for someone who is uh, a, vulnerable, a vulnerable person. Um, now you've got to move into that area where you do... Um, you do what, what embrace or engage with that, that that great difficulty they carry inside. So, what are the next? Uh, what are the next? The ways in which we can safely and and comfortably do that. How, how do you manage that? So, one before I start, or I mean, in this process, you know, one of the next things I would ask is, you know, what what are your hopes by coming here today? And that comes in that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And so, you know, they would tell me and uh, then, you know, I usually move into, you know, what bothers you the most? And I just sit back and, you know, as, as you know, you know, if you do that, people usually just tell you the story uh. and you usually get the framework of really what's at the core. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you use that framework, you know, during the rest of the interview to really go deeper and explore that. Yeah, you're really allowing the picture to build uh, rather than leaping into any, you know, doing any leaping. Um, I mean, of course, I imagine if the client leaps, then you leap with them. But yeah. that's, a, that's a really important thing, Matt, isn't it? The, yes. This, this gentle flow. Absolutely. Now, we have this concept of um, controllable incongruence where, you know, the brain is uh, to shift any sort of neural connections. We need to sort of not overwhelm the client uh, because then, you know, the whole stress response kicks in. Um, but this concept of controllable incongruence where we're sort of pushing the bounds and changing our minds in a, in a measured, gradual way, how do you in your therapy room um, sort of walk that, uh, that line where you're not overwhelming the client, but you're sort of pushing things so there is some effective change? What you mean is really pushing them to the edge of the window of tolerance, right? Not yes. over the edge, but right to the edge where you can do, I think, the best work. Absolutely. Yeah, window of tolerance. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, I think, uh, you know, when somebody presents with affect, you know, that you go into that affect, right? Mm -hmm. That you, you know, really crescendo that affect to the point where you get to that edge of the window of tolerance not beyond and then you just stay at that edge you know yeah. through you know the relationship right through, you know certain interventions that you may have to do if somebody you know gets outside of that window of tolerance 
And is it an intuitive sense where, where they are sort of pushing up to the edge of that? Or, or are they sort of the physiological markers that you're looking for? I think both, right? right. I think you can't underscore the importance of intuition in treatment. Yes. Right? But I mean, there's certainly you, you watch very closely and you're tracking the individual's, you know, face and body, you know, for, for example, you know, are they getting shaky? Or, you know, are they having sound, you know, signs of hypoarousal, for example, where their breath may become very shallow, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you check in with them, you know, what's that like for you? You know, yeah. you're, you know, you're feeling very sad or you're feeling a lot of shame. What's happening inside right now? And one thing I love to ask is, you know, when they start to dissociate sometimes, you know, how much of you is here right now? Oh, and people will know. Yeah, that's great. Right? Right? They'll say, yeah. oh, 20 percent. And, you know, then asking them, well, what what do you need to bring more of you online? Right. So right. That, that constant interaction and uh, collaboration. Right? Yeah. Now, when we bring sort of the um, the affect and the autobiographical sort of memory, maybe into maybe, the room. Yeah. Um, where it's where it's safe, is it that juxtaposition of the the manifestation of affect before we hit, before we go over the window of tolerance in a safe environment? Is that the thing that is that is affecting change here? Just trying to you know sort of tease out the mechanism that's going on here for change. Yeah, and I think it's not necessarily the autobiographical memory. Actually, mm -hmm. often. When people become very overwhelmed, you, you know, you, I mean, what we do is we go only to bodily sensations. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a way of titrating, right? So just working with those bodily sensations and disconnecting, you know, the the more cognitive aspects. And yeah. so I think it depends on the client. But I think, yeah, getting to that certain intensity, and I think you know that can often shift you know, patterns of brain firing and probably patterns of synchrony of brain mm -hmm. firing and getting online, you know, certain horizontal and vertical connections that have been lacking. That's sort of how I think about it. Does that make any sense to you? Yes, no, yes. No, no, it doesn't. There's a lot. Yeah. 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 That, that, that integrate that the idea. Integration. And uh, of course, Dan Siegel writes it uh, very yeah. nicely in one of his early books of the different different levels. But you find, uh, I, I'm also very excited by uh, Ledoux's work at, uh, and uh, Richard Brown talking about the nature of the nature of how autobiographical um, input affects our emotional state. So actually, uh, avoiding that, or rather, not um, not specifically going there, can be very helpful to keep to the what you might call the fundamental truth of the um, of the experience that they're they're biologically feeling. Absolutely, and yeah, it's, I think it's really about working to get to certain thresholds that allows that synchrony of firing and that integration, right? Right. And I think when we think about autobiographical memory, as I think about it now, one thing that we're missing in the field is that we often don't think about the embodiment of autobiographical memory, right? We think of it as a cognitive phenomenon, but I think there's a real embodiment of autobiographical memory. And I think in the future, that's something the field will really need to embrace. Mm -hmm. Now, can I throw in, since we've been talking to Seaburn Fisher about neurofeedback, um, can we throw that into the mix and what you've learned um, through those techniques of neurofeedback in the brain, you know, sort of uh, healing itself um, almost. Uh, can, you, can you let us know what you've discovered is in, in terms of the healing process in using neurofeedback? Yeah, and I met Seaburn uh, several years ago and was very lucky to be introduced to neurofeedback by her. It was actually a course that was being put on by Bessel van der Kolk in Boston. So I flew down and had the chance to get training in neurofeedback. And it's really changed my clinical practice. Right. And uh, what I find is that the neurofeedback really helps to shift the brain quicker. And mm -hmm. so... 
you know, emotional awareness can come online much quicker. It can break through dissociative barriers. Uh, people can break through dissociative barriers much quicker. And so as a therapist, you really have to be on the ball much more because all these processes are coming online, I think, often quicker. And so, you know, as somebody gets more in touch with their feelings and as somebody feels more integrated, right, they're right. going through a real shift in identity, right? And all that needs to be processed with the individual. Now, and what what we've learned from neurofeedback, is there something that we can, as therapists who do talk therapy, is there anything that we can glean from, from those techniques and, and bring into the therapy room ourselves? Yeah, I think neurofeedback is such a different approach, and I mm. think it really uh, forces you to think more about brain mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, you're thinking about what protocol to use, you know, what areas of the brain you may be affecting, how they're affected by trauma. Um, you know, often you do qualitative EEGs that I think are very yep. helpful to help you understand, you know, how high are the beta waves, for example, which often links to anxiety, how, you know, intense are the slow waves, which can be related to dissociation or brain injury, right? So... I think it's a very different way of thinking, but combined with psychotherapy, I think it really has the capacity to really enhance or really, yeah, enhance the practice. Yeah, so when you're working with a client and you're not using neurofeedback, are you th are you is your mind there as well in terms of what's going on in their brain with beta waves and what have you? Yes, it is, because I've been trained in that way now, and yeah. I'm also a neuroscientist, and I know a lot of therapists, you know, are really interested in that, but I think when you're doing neurofeedback, it brings you even closer to that. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the fundamental things is, uh, is that we're not, we're not uh, wisely educated uh, about the brain as, as we go, and, and one of the mistakes that we take from talk therapy training is that we have a lot of self-directed control over what uh, of what happens in our neurons, whereas a, a lot of it is exactly to say it's it's interactions with body responses, and it's implicit responses. Sort of, um, uh, we know we have lots of arguments whether it's uh, subcortical or this or that. So we don't want to get you know it can get technical, but that a lot of what happens uh, when we're doing talk therapy that we think is a talk therapy is actually totally different stuff that the body is almost going off on its own trip with saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the talk. But, but, uh, you, you keep talking and I'll go off and do, um, the, the good productive, the productive work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that aspect of, of giving the, the, the body its own opportunity to, to work in ways that we can't directly access. Is that, uh, am I on the right sort of awareness there? What do you think? Absolutely. And I think neurofeedback does that. You know, I mm. see that very much as setting the brain on the right track. And I think talk therapy does that as well, right? You know, you often see, for example, when you're doing a session of EMDR, right, that, you know, the, per the person starts to process, they're not even quite with you because they're so preoccupied, right? Yeah. And this goes on, you know, for several days, sometimes, you know, a few weeks. And over time, the brain continues to shift. Right. So I think it's very much about, you know, this is driven by neural circuits that, of course, also have an effect on the body. So brain and body circuits that, you know, we can really set on the right path during treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Ruth, you've articulated a lot of what you know in, in one of your recent books, uh, Healing the Traumat Traumatized Self, which I, I have a copy here. And so I'm just wondering, would you be able to give our listeners just a very um, brief, what are they in for um, if, <laughs> if, they, if they purchase your book? Um, I, I know what they're in for, but I'd like to hear it from you. <laughs> Sure. And um, this book was co-authored with Paul Fruin, my colleague in London, Ontario. And basically, we were really interested in looking how trauma can affect five dimensions of consciousness, which are time, thought, body, emotion, and intersubjectivity. Yep. And for each of those two dimensions of, con of consciousness, we divided them into trauma-related altered states of consciousness and normal waking consciousness. 
And, uh, you know, we really wanted to uh, understand more and provide a framework and a model to understand severe trauma and the effects of repeated trauma on these five dimensions of consciousness and how trauma can be related to trauma-related altered states of consciousness or dissociative experiences. And it's certainly it's certainly a book that gets you to to look at your um, your client, especially with complex trauma, um, with a much more sophisticated framework. So for that, I thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it fits one of the terms that I use is, is sensitivity. It increases your sensitivity uh, in um, in appreciating what the client is bringing forward. Because I, I, you've you've hinted at and alluded to it in the way, but maybe just highlight that the. The client's very brave uh, to bring these things forward, and yeah. and that's a trick for the the therapist. Uh, you, you work very hard at making yourself able to allow them to do that. It seems. Absolutely. I mean, it takes huge amount of courage, especially if you've been if you've been hurt by caregivers. You come into the relationship with the expectation of being hurt, right? And I think that's so important to keep in mind as a trauma therapist. And so how do we work around that and how do we allow people and make them feel as safe as possible, you know, to bring forth some of the most painful and difficult things for them. And I think we've learned a lot uh, through this COVID pandemic. And mm -hmm. one thing I found is that a lot of my severely traumatized clients actually like this virtual treatment because I think it decreases the hypervigilance, right? They're not in the office with me, so I think it's less threatening. And I'm, I'm amazed at some of the depth of work I've been able to do virtually. And I think, you know, when I ask my patients, you know, how do you find this? You know, a number of them are saying, this is easier. You know, I can be at home, I feel safer at home, and I think it's allowed me to do deeper work. So I think there's a lot of things to think about, right? Yeah, we've heard this from a, a few uh, yeah. a, a few sources. It's a, and I've I've certainly experienced it myself, uh, which mm. is which is really true. Because I just as I was, you were talking there, I was thinking, you know, the caregivers and so on uh, that that are often their source of trauma. And there mm. you are saying, hey, I'm another caregiver, yeah, right? <laughs> Don't uh, right? Trust me. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, Ruth, we'd like, love to um, point our uh, listeners to some of the latest, uh, you know, thinking and research um, that's been going on. And uh, I certainly, you know, you've done uh, you've done a recent webinar uh, with Seaburn on the neurofeedback, so we can point people to um, to that. But what else would you? Um, suggest that people look at? You've done a lot of writing of papers yourself. Uh, what would be sort of top of the list? Uh, I think one thing our group has been very interested in, in is in looking at a neurobiological model of a sense of self. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this network that's really active at, at rest in the brain. It's called the default mode network. It's sort of like when your brain is in neutral, like your car in neutral. You know, when you're engaged in introspective thought, this network is also very much involved in autobiographical memory and relating to others. And it, it, it plays a key role in knowing what you feel and also having a future. And when the brain is at rest, and I say at rest in quotation marks, because a trauma brain is never at rest. But yeah. what I mean by at rest is, you know, you just let your mind wander. And what we see in this network in traumatized individuals that it's very disruptive and that only the back part of the network is connected and it has no connections to the front part which gives you a future that helps you to know what you feel and it also has no connections to the parietal lobe that helps you to have an embodied sense of space in time. In time. But what's really interesting is the only time we see this network somewhat connected is under conditions of threat, either subliminal threat or conscious threat triggers. And so under threat, somehow this network becomes more connected. And I think we really have to ask ourselves what that means. And I think this also has huge implications for therapy. 
And when we think about uh, some of our traumatized clients, they tell us the only time they feel alive is when they're engaged in reckless behavior, for example, right? Or when they're shoplifting. And I think one of the key things we need to figure out is how do we help connect this network under conditions of rest so it's not just connected under extreme hyperarousal conditions, which so many of our traumatized clients seek. And I have a beautiful quote from a traumatized individual who says, you know, just before she was you know, shoplifting and when she feels that terror, that's the only time she feels a semblance of a sense of self. Right. That's, that's it. Yeah. And that's and that just as what I was thinking, sort of, wow, you know, you, you, you only feel complete when you're in this in the framework of, of trauma and this default mode network, which, you know, and we've talked about it uh, at various times. It's a, it's a very important aspect. And, and I must admit that it, uh, it's one of the areas I, I do a lot of work in curiosity as a, as a stimulator, yeah. as yeah. a brain stimulator. And, uh, yeah. And and I can see uh, another. Um, I just read, you know, all I want is more money, a large university, and lots of um, uh, of young people running around doing the work. <sighs> I know we all want that, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So we can we can sort of you know explore that a little bit more um, with uh, the way that the def default mode is disrupted, and what that is uh, robbing. Uh, these clients of, and how to how to restore it. Yeah, so this is obviously a very important new area. This is the next area of of, of release. Is that is that where people are doing work uh, in, Ruth? Absolutely, a lot of trauma researchers are doing that work. Our group is doing it more in relationship to also clinical experience, mm -hmm. and so we're really trying to relate the individual subjective experience of the sense of self with the default mode network functioning and we're also really starting to look at how you know when this network connects under conditions of severe hypervigilance how that may be related to traumatic reenactments okay brilliant okay now watch watch this space okay uh, are, there, are there places that we can point people to to Absolutely. Stay I'll in the loop. A, a couple of papers. Uh, one is about to be published. One is about to be accepted. So I'll send those to you. Oh, Wonderful. Brilliant. We'll, brilliant. we'll put those in the show notes so that people can click through to those. Ruth, is there anything that uh, you'd like to leave our listeners with before we before we leave? No, I think I just would like to leave everyone with a note of hope. I think severely traumatized uh, individuals can be uh, very difficult to treat. But I think as we learn more therapeutic approaches, as we use more integrative approaches, and as we understand more what happens in the brain, I think we can develop more empathy for those individuals, but also become much more skillful at treating severely traumatized clients. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ruth Lenius, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful. And we look forward to everyone getting in and soaking up that book of yours. That sounds like some marvelous stuff. Thanks very much, Ruth. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye.